my name is Kevin Trenberth, Dr. Kevin Trenberth. I'm a distinguished senior scientist at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Um, let's talk about 2016 first, because uh, it's likely going to end up being named the, the warmest year on record, right? That's right. I think one of the questions that a lot of people have, including myself, we were at the tail end of an El Nino pattern uh, in the beginning of 2016. How much of that do we think contributed to this uh, top warmest year status? Oh, well, the 2015-16 uh, El Nino, it certainly went well into uh, 2016, uh, played a major role. So the warmest 12 months on record was from about September 2015 to September to uh, August of 2016. And then, and so the la latter part of 2015 is warmer than the last part of 2016, as we have gone back into cooler conditions in the tropical Pacific Ocean. Uh, the main process that goes on in El Nino is that in the second half of the El Nino, uh, heat comes out of the ocean into the atmosphere, and that contributes especially to the global warming. And so that's especially that period that I just mentioned. And so it's, even though the El Nino itself was over in the springtime, the heat is still coming out of the ocean as an effect of the El Nino for a number of months, at least three months after the El Nino is over. So it's like, so when, a, it it's like, it's like when a radiator turns off, it doesn't get cold immediately, it still radiates that, heat. That's correct. And, and, and so I, I, I'm not quite sure what the number will be, but it's probably of the order of three-tenths of a degree Celsius that the El Nino has contributed to the overall global mean surface temperature record globally. How did this El Nino, this most recent El Nino, interact with the overall warming climate signal in the background? Well, you know, the global mean temperature is one thing, but it's the influence of the warming climate on on everything else, which really uh, pays dividends, which really has major effects. And the main memory of the global warming is through the oceans. And so the oceans are warmer than they used to be. We can now measure this much more accurately, and there's some new work of ours actually coming out uh, very soon, which shows that the oceans have been warming more than we thought. And, uh, and so this is the memory of of past global warming. And so it connects to the atmosphere through the sea surface temperatures. And the sea surface temperatures have been running, uh, well, on average, uh, without the El Nino, uh, more than one degree Fahrenheit above values prior to 1970 or thereabouts. Uh, what that does is it makes the atmosphere warmer and moister all over the oceans, and especially in There's more moisture in the atmosphere. There's more moisture to get sucked into all of the storms. And firstly, that invigorates the storms. And secondly, it means that it rains harder or it can snow harder in the middle of winter than it would otherwise do. And we've seen that uh, in spades over the last year because the El Nino contribution uh, means that it actually adds to the normal global warming and we're seeing we've been seeing over the last year the sort of things that will become routine for us say 15 or 20 years from now and and so what we see are stronger droughts things dry out a little quicker uh, more wildfires in California and the West Coast in particular in other parts around the world South Africa and, and uh, Indonesia and uh, the uh, heavy rains, especially. And so in the U.S., we've seen it in, in Houston uh, and then in Louisiana with major flooding and then with Hurricane Matthew along the southeast coast, all uh, with uh, over a thousand year events, according to the statistics, which are really based upon a non-changing climate. And so, of course, they're not really thousand year events anymore, but that's the magnitude of the kinds of flooding that we've seen. And we're seeing this more and more in different places around the world. And so the global warming adds to the natural variability. The natural variability sort of determines where these events take place. 
And so uh, there's, there's still a lot of variety in that. It's not locked into one single place. It doesn't happen everywhere all at once. But that's the way in which the global warming is manifested. It happened here in Minneapolis. We just wrapped up 2016 as the wettest year on record uh, for the city of Minneapolis. And I wonder, is there a way to concretely link that occurrence to climate change? Can we attribute climate change to our wettest year on record? Very likely uh, with a contribution. And in fact, one of the main expectations with uh, global warming is that because the atmosphere is a little warmer uh, and the atmosphere can hold 4% more moisture for one degree Fahrenheit uh, increase in temperature. And so if the atmosphere is running warmer, uh, there, there tends to be more moisture in it and it rains harder. And so one of the very robust findings in our climate models as you project into the future is that it gets wetter uh, in in uh, middle and high latitudes, especially in the winter half of the year. And, you know, uh, I, we've just experienced here in Boulder uh, a major snowstorm. It's very much like a spring snowstorm. Our snowiest month is, is March, but uh, we had 15 inches of snow here yesterday. I mean, this is very unusual in January because normally you have the idea that in the middle of a continent, it's too cold to snow much and you get very light. Right diamond dust and i'm sure you experienced that uh, in minneapolis we have our uh, share of cold yeah well, um so go ahead i'm sorry yeah so so just to finish just to finish that thought the uh the ability for it to snow uh, harder uh in in winter is actually one of the symptoms of global warming and this is one of the things which has been misinterpreted uh, for instance, by Senator Inhofe in the, in the U.S. Senate, where um, I guess the general public often thinks snow is being associated with, with winter and cold. But in actual fact, most of the snow occurs uh, when the temperatures are very close, close to freezing from about, say, 28 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, if it does get colder, it does tend to freeze dry the atmosphere and the amounts of snow go down. So, sure, at, at first glance, it seems like, well, it, it, well, we used to refer to it as global warming. Now it's more climate change. People think that certainly couldn't produce more snow, but in fact it does. Um, I, I wonder, for the second time in two years, we saw the temperatures around or near the North Pole go to the freezing point or a little above. How much of that is driven by climate change, and why does that statistic matter to all of us the biggest changes that are occurring probably in the world are have been occurring in the arctic and in that region there is a strong what we call a feedback process a reinforcing process so that as the amount of sea ice goes down there's a darker ocean surface or over land a uh, darker land surface which then absorbs more of the solar radiation and that tends to amplify the change that has occurred earlier. And so this process is clearly going on in the Arctic, and uh, it, it, but it only plays a role in the summer half of the year. And what you're talking about is really in the, in the middle of winter. And so there, uh, the, the process is more complicated and it re relates more generally to the overall uh, climate change that's going on. The biggest source of large changes in waves, and this also in the atmosphere, uh, is, is, is from the tropics, and it relates to the heavier rainfalls that are occurring in the tropics. So this does relate indeed in that respect to climate change. And so with the El Nino phenomenon, although the El Nino itself in terms of the sea surface temperatures was about as big as in 1998, the effects we saw around the world in terms of the changes in hurricanes and typhoons and the heavy rainfalls in, in various parts of the tropics are much greater because there's an overall warming that has gone on in between times and the atmosphere is holding more moisture. So what this does is it, it, it puts uh, more heat into the atmosphere or in various parts of the tropics that in turn acts like a rock in the stream of the atmospheric flow and generates waves which actually have an influence all the way across the poles in both hemispheres, uh, more so in the winter half of the year. And, and so this affects the Arctic and uh, so the cold air 
certainly forms in the Arctic in winter. I mean, there's a polar night. There's no sunshine there. But uh, when it got very warm in the Arctic this time, it was extremely cold originally in Siberia. The cold air had moved over there. And then more recently, some of the cold air has come down into the U.S., Okay, so it's more related to the fact that there was this um, big cold trough and correspondingly there has to be a peak somewhere to offset that than it does with the, the lack or the disappearing of sea ice, Arctic sea ice. Is that, is that true? This is, so this relates to the waves in the atmosphere. When it's very warm somewhere, it's almost inevitably cold somewhere else. And, and this is very familiar to, to us when we really think about it. And uh, it's, it's not just the, the changes in the sea ice, but th those changes in sea ice are certainly probably reinforcing the other changes that are going on. Great. Um, one final question. When, based on your experience and research, when we look back at 2016, 10, 20, 50 years from now, the fact that it was the warmest at this point in our history. Do you think that will mean anything? Will we, will we look back and, and, and say we should have known something by that stat? Well, I think we do. And, and the, you know, there was certainly a, a stalling of the increase in the global mean surface temperature from the big El Nino in 1998 uh, until about, say, 2013. But then 2014 came in as the warmest year on record by a hair, not by much. But 2015 then jumped up substantially in 2016 even more. And so now we're back on track where you can clearly, more clearly see that the overall temperatures are increasing. And so this debate about the so-called pause in the global mean surface temperature or, or hiatus in the global mean surface temperature rise, uh, I think that should be behind us now and what we have learned i think in the process is that indeed there's a lot of natural variability that goes on in the atmosphere in the climate system but that there are other indicators like sea level rise and the heat content in the oceans that are much more uh, monotonically increasing, more steadily increasing, that show that global warming is clearly occurring and we better watch out because it has consequences. Uh, I thought of one final question. What, what do you see for 2017 in terms of the global mean uh, temperature? Well, at the moment we have a, a somewhat weak La Nina going on in the, in the tropical Pacific. That will probably continue until the spring, but it doesn't look like it's very strong. It's nevertheless having some quite distinctive uh, influences on the weather patterns across the United States. Uh, the heavy rains that are coming into Northern California, for instance, and that brought the snows into Colorado here uh, yesterday were um, much more of a spring-like pattern in, in some respects, and they're certainly being influenced by, by that kind of thing. And, and so there will be some regional imprints of, of the La Nina in different parts around the world. Uh, that means droughts in, in some places and, uh, and uh, heavier rains uh, in others. In the, in the far west and Pacific and Southeast Asia, the monsoon is likely to be a little better, um, uh, but very dry conditions in Peru and Ecuador and, and, uh, and places like that. Um, probably some abatement in of the droughts that have been occurring in Africa, uh, which would be a, a great relief. Um, it it will be a cooler year than 2015 and 2016, but not by so much. I think we have you know one way of thinking about the global mean surface temperature is that it's more like going up a step ladder uh, or up a ladder. A staircase rather than uh, a steady rise and at the moment we've sort of taken a step up and you know we've stalled a little bit we may go down a little bit but we'll, we won't go back down to the previous levels that we've seen earlier uh, back in say the 1990s or earlier and so global warming is uh, clearly continuing uh, and it has it has consequences in places where uh, the hurricanes occur uh, the risk of damage is much greater, and you know we've we've seen that even over the past year, um, especially uh, in uh, uh, China and uh, the Philippines and uh, Southeast Asia, um, and uh, uh, threats to Hawaii 
uh, the most vigorous storm uh, in the on record uh, ever, a uh, hurricane uh, that hit Fiji uh, over the past year. You know, these kind of events will continue, but they will be, again, somewhat spotty. And it's up to the climate scientists and the meteorologists to, um, to recognize that this is actually the way in which global warming is manifested. Great. Uh, anything else you want to add? Well, you know, one of the concerns going into the future is whether we can keep adequate tabs on this. And so uh, tracking, uh, continuing to build our uh, monitoring systems, uh, all of the satellites and the observations of planet Earth is, is very important. And there have been some indications under the new Congress that there may be some threats to Earth observations. And, and so uh, I, I certainly hope that doesn't happen. It would be... Uh, it's very important for us to be able to understand what is going on and why and, and what that implies for the future.